Hi, Hi I'm uh, Nico Kolodny. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'm Simon Keller, associate professor of philosophy at Victoria University, Wellington in New Zealand. And Nico and I are going to have a chat about uh, love in this discussion. Um, we're going to talk about questions like what reasons there are to love, and a little bit later, perhaps, about what the differences are between different kinds of love, and in particular, between loving persons and loving things like uh, countries. Um, but Nico, um, a lot of your work has been focused on the question of what our reasons for loving people are. Um, and maybe we could start by just, I suppose, addressing the point that um, it's quite funny in some ways to think of love as a rational thing or as something that's governed by reasons. So what uh, makes you think that there are reasons for love in the first place, or that it even makes sense to talk about love as a response to, to reasons? Right, right. Um, well, maybe, maybe just for the, um, for the benefit of our Blogging Heads viewers, I'll just make clear a distinction, which I think maybe will underlie our discussion. That's the distinction between uh, an explanatory reason and a justifying or normative reason. So an explanatory reason uh, is just something that tells you why something in fact happened, whereas a justifying or a normative reason uh, tells you why something ought to happen or should happen. Um, and typically the things in question are going to be human responses like beliefs or um, actions or feelings. Um, so clearly it, it doesn't seem particularly controversial to say that there are explanatory reasons for love. I mean, love happens, there must be some cause of it. Um, the, the question that really seems more controversial, controversial, and as you've pointed out, actually uh, uh, at least a, a bit jarring in first hearing, um, is that um, there are normative or justifying reasons for love. Um, now, I think it, it can seem especially odd to say um, that there are reasons for love if you build into that certain assumptions about reasons. If, for example, you think that um, we can only have reasons um, for states that are under our voluntary control that we choose to have, or that we can only have reasons for states that we typically form by thinking about our reasons, weighing them up, and then um, responding uh, as we see fit. I mean, um, so that might be true of, say, reasons for action, that we voluntarily control them and that we think about the reasons before um, reaching a decision. Uh, but it seems that there are other kind of states which we normally say that there are reasons for, like you have reasons to be afraid or you have reasons not to be afraid, for example. I have reasons to be afraid of a grizzly bear that's uh, um, approaching me but not to be afraid of the plush sofa cushions that I see at the other end of my office. Um, and these, uh, um, so there can be reasons for these sorts of states, um, even though um, they're not things that we um, uh, think about and form our responses on the basis of thinking about them. So, I mean, maybe a lot of this discussion is really, um, you could drop the talk of reasons if you wanted to and talk about whether or not love is appropriate or um, inappropriate in its own right. Um, and so the claim that there are normative or justifying reasons for love, if that seems too um, rebarbative, you might say, uh, you might rephrase it as, you know, um, are there considerations that make certain kinds of love for particular people appropriate and other kinds of love inappropriate? Um, and I think that I think um, that we that we actually do think that. I mean, I think if we look, for example, at the abused wife whose husband just treats her awfully, and it isn't just that he treats her awfully, but he actually doesn't have any genuine concern for her. Um, I think that we would say that she she doesn't have reason um, to love him, or that it, her not loving him would be perfectly um, appropriate. Um, and I think also failures to love can be inappropriate. So the case of the abused wife is a case maybe where the love is inappropriate. Um, but I think that there are also cases where um, the failure to love can be inappropriate. So if I just, you know, read the roster from my, um, my daughter's preschool class, I should be careful about this and not use any actual names. It'd be a little too creepy. But suppose I look at this roster and I see this kid named Fred and just seeing the name, I suddenly start to love Fred and I stop loving my daughter. Now, that wouldn't just be strange, but I think that we, we think that something was really going wrong there, that my love for Fred was would be inappropriate in the circumstances and my failure to love uh, my daughter, which is the 
more important point here is um, that that failure to love would also be inappropriate. Um, so there are other question. considerations which have... Yeah, yeah, so maybe I'll stop there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so what do you think... Uh, so granting that it would be inappropriate to love Fred, um, but more appropriate to love your, obviously to love your daughter, I mean, is there something that this means that you ought to do if you find yourself loving Fred and failing to love your daughter in the same way? Would you then be rationally or you know, perhaps morally required to take steps to sort of extinguish the feelings that you're developing for Fred and to uh, restore the feelings that you're losing for your daughter? Do you think it has, you know, practical uh, consequences uh, in that? Uh, 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 yes, I would think in, in, in this case, it, I, right. I think in this case it, it would, in the same way as if you found that you had a kind of phobic response to sofa cushions, um, that that might be something that would make sense to take steps, seek therapy or, you know, get some, um, you know, reuptake inhibitor, you know, inhibitors or whatever you needed to do to uh, not to have that, that irrational response to something which really isn't fearful. Right. So what kind of judgment then are we making? Like, what, what are the considerations that make it appropriate, for example, to love your daughter but not to love uh, Fred, or that make it appropriate to love, uh, you know, a romantic partner as opposed to someone you just meet in the street? Is it that they are so wonderful as compared to others, or, or is it something else? What kinds of answers, you know, do you reckon you could give to those questions, and which do you favour? Right, okay. So, I mean, I think if you ask, um, uh, you know, the person off the street... Um, you know, why do you love your wife, for example? Um, or what is it that you love about your daughter? Um, I think that they'll typically appeal to features that that, you know, that their beloved has in her own right. Um, so, you know, and uh, so I would say that my wife is beautiful or that she's good, funny, and so on. Um, but it seems to me that that sort of common sense answer um, actually is really puzzling if you press it, because... Suppose that um, my wife were to have a twin. So I just discovered that she had this that she had this twin who was, um, as far as um, my wife is concerned, uh, as far as all the properties that my wife has in her own right, this um, this twin also has. Um, so she's just as funny, just as kind, just as. Um, until I'm going to get sorry, I'm going to get in trouble with this example. So, you know, actually, honey, you know, with, with these philosophical examples, we're often using sort of these very outlandish hypotheticals. This could never happen. I could never find anybody who is as um, beautiful and funny. But just you know, per impossible. Suppose I were to come across this person. Now, if I were to come across this person, and um, sort of the thing that made my love appropriate were the features. Um, that my wife has in her own right, and if this twin has exactly the same features, um, then it looks like my love, insofar as it's responsive to the things that make it appropriate, um, it could just as um, uh, easily, just as soon swap the two. And it seems that whatever love is, um, it doesn't it doesn't accept substitutes in that way, which suggests to me that um, whatever the um, Whatever, uh, whatever explains, uh, whatever justifies why I have reason to love my wife and not to love the twin, it's going to be some relation between her and me. Now, you might say the relation is my present love for my wife, but if you say it's my present love, um, then it looks like love can never be inappropriate and the failure to love can never be inappropriate. If you love the person, then if your reason is just that you love them, then that love is going to be appropriate. If you don't love someone, then that reason isn't present. You don't love them. And so um, that failure to love is, is also going to be appropriate. So it seems to me that, that the relation, it has to be some kind of relation you bear to the person. And it seems to me that the relation has to do with the past. It has to do with your shared history. So I think ultimately, in a nutshell, my view is that um, the reasons for loving people are the histories that you share with them. You know, with my wife, she's the woman I met years back, and we had all these experiences together, um, and I don't have those with the twin. Um, and in the case of my daughter and Fred Simmons, you know, it, she's my daughter, and, and Fred isn't. Um, uh, she's the, the girl so Fred Simmons, isn't it? I, knew, I knew it was Fred. I was wondering which Fred. But... Oh, sorry. <laughs> right, right, right. To make it even creepier. Yeah, I've added yeah. The, uh, the surname, yeah. So, Nico, but, but what if your wife were to say to you, um, look, uh, one of the things that makes me feel good about myself, this is your wife speaking, is the fact that you love me. 
and um, it gives me a reason to feel better about myself when other things are going badly and so on. But it turns out that the, the thing you love about me is something just to do with our history, and you could just as well share that history with someone who had a terrible sense of humour and was not beautiful and um, treated you badly, perhaps. Um, I, I guess the concern is that perhaps, at least in the case of romantic um, relationships, it's, it's not enough to say, well you're just lucky enough to have latched on to me and to share this history, which could in principle be shared with a complete schmuck as well. <laughs> right, right. I mean, so maybe I'll, I might say a bit about the romantic case in, in, in particular and then also say something about the worry in, in general. Um, yeah, I mean, in the romantic case, I would say, um, you know, it has to do to some extent with, with what the relevant history is. And I think the relevant history is going to involve, um, you know, to put it incredibly... Um, uh, crudely, uh, um, the, the history is going to involve a history of kind of positive responses we've had to each other um, in the past, whereas, um, for example, in the case of someone who had treated me horribly, there wouldn't be those positive responses. And some of those positive responses or activities um, are, you might say, they're not going to be possible um, unless I appreciated some of her... Um, intrinsic features, some of the, the qualities she has in her own right. I mean, her beauty and her, you know, if we didn't share the same sense of humor, we wouldn't have had certain kinds of experiences together. So in the case of romantic love, that's, that's um, I'd, I'd say that um, the reason why typically, one of the reasons why when we typically um, love someone appropriately, we also um, think well of their intrinsic characteristics is in part because the history is in part constituted by activities which wouldn't be possible unless we appreciated those those characteristics. But I think, you know, step, stepping back, I think the worry, and you know, and you put it very nicely by putting it in the, um, in, the, um, in the voice of my wife is, I mean, it is a worry that I still have about this kind of answer, which is that it seems to somehow suggest that, you know, we, we do or should love relationships, not people. I mean, it somehow seems to suggest that, um, uh, you know, our attitudes towards the people we love really are like, or the people we say we love, on my account, would really be like the attitudes the two ice dancers might have, you know, that they, um, they, you know, they, they, what they really care about is the beautiful thing, the ice dance. Um, and they view one another, of course, they view them as human beings, but as far as the ice dance is concerned, they're just things they need to, to you know, to create this this um, this this thing which you know is is independently worthwhile. Um, uh, I don't think that that's. I think there are things I can say. I don't think that that's quite fair, but I think you know, at the end of the day, some version of that worry is gonna um, is gonna linger about this kind of relationship account. Yeah. Maybe I can put what I think might be a similar, or maybe a different worry, but um, uh -huh. a different kind of. A different kind of case. Um, what would you say about a case uh, in which... So, so here's a case, which I know, um, you know I think we've probably chatted about before or discussed, but in the movie there's something about Mary. Um, the movie is about the fact that the Ben Stiller... Or revolves around the fact that the Ben Stiller character loves the Cameron Diaz character. Yet the relationship between the Ben Stiller character and the Cameron <laughs> Diaz character is absolutely horrible. And... Um, Certainly from Ted, who's the Ben Stiller character, from, from his point of view, um, when he thinks about his relationship with um, the Cameron Diaz character, Mary, he wouldn't see it as justifying anything very much. It's a relationship in which he's acted as a stalker, in which he's humiliated <laughs> himself in front of her several times. Um, and yet it still seems as though he manages to love her, and not only that, but that her, his love is appropriate and um, that in the end she makes the right decision in eventually, you know, taking on this complete loser, uh, or someone who <laughs> appeared, appeared to her to be a complete loser as her romantic partner. Um, and I suppose this is just another, another. you know, we, we might also think about cases like Love at First Sight, where it seems like you can have, at least, you know, the way we think about, about it, genuine, uh, deep love in the complete absence of any kind of relationship. But do you think that those kinds of loves can be also appropriate or justified in the ways that you know, loving someone who you've been married to for some time could be. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, that's an excellent example. I mean, in two respects. First, it's it's sufficiently low brow that I actually I, I was worried that you were going to use the, the the Kingsley Amos example from your paper, or the Martin Amos example. But I'm glad that yeah. So I've actually seen that movie. Yeah. Uh, so I <laughs> I can speak knowledgeably knowledgeably about it. Um, uh, and it is yeah. It, it, it's a it's it is a troubling case. I don't know quite what to quite what to, to say about that. I mean, what I was, I can say what I was first inclined to say about, um, uh, uh, you know, the objection um, to my view that it implies that there's no such thing as love at first sight. And I, my initial response to that is to say, yeah, well, there really isn't love at first sight. I mean, there, there's attraction at first sight, you know, so I see, you know, I see the, the man or woman from across the room and, you know, some, a spark just goes off. And um, I, uh, I can see, you um, uh, being attracted to that person, which then might lead to activities which, on my view, would create the right sort of shared history. But it seemed to me that that attraction wasn't necessarily um, wasn't necessarily love, um, because for one thing, it wasn't clear that it really did kind of accept. Um, uh, it wasn't clear to me that it, that that it didn't accept substitutes. You know, if I blinked and then suddenly someone else across the room with exactly the same sort of beauty and smile was there, I'm not exactly sure that um, there would be anything wrong with my sort of transferring my affections from one to the other. Um, but you know, in the case of something about Mary, it seems like the Ben Stiller character really would um, not accept a substitute in that case. Um, so I'm less clear about, you know, what to say about that. Right. Um, I mean, I, there does seem to be something like the anticipation of some kind of relationship or some sort of reciprocation, um, that if we really consider a case of unrequited love where it's really doomed to be unrequited, at a certain point, I, I, I do think that we think that the unrequited love um, is not just, um, you know, bad for the, for the lover, because they're disappointed all the time, but it's also at a certain at, at a certain point it begins to shade off into um, something like um, a kind of irrationality or localized insanity. I, I realize that's an incredibly unromantic <laughs> thing to say, um, but but I do think that that's the way that we actually think about it. Right. Um, well, maybe um, we, sh we should move on to something different shortly. But can I try just one one last case with you? Sure. Um, yeah. Please. Yeah. So I guess the converse of that is a case of two people who have had a relationship which in normal circumstance, you know, in terms of the description of the relationship, there's nothing particularly aberrant or strange about it. Perhaps they've been married for some time and their relationship has been characterised by interactions in which they, you know, uh, help each other. It may even be the case that they very much appreciate each other. They think of each other as wonderful people. And yet they... Uh, have just come to realise that they both make each other miserable. They're just <laughs> competitive and, you know, mutually annoying and uh, that they'd really both be happier outside the marriage, not because they dislike each other necessarily, but just because um, that's, uh, that's where they found themselves. Do you think in that case they ought to continue the marriage anyway, seeing as the relationship that they have, you know, presumably still provides the reasons that it would under normal circumstances or... Is there something else? Is there something else going on there? I suppose the concern is that we might find ourselves suddenly uh, restricted by the fact that we've had these relationships with people. Suddenly, these relationships require us to do things that make us miserable and make other people miserable too. Namely, to continue relationships that have become, you know, perhaps dysfunctional. Right, right, right. I mean, so I guess, um, but my tendency is to sort those into into those kinds of cases, you know, where continuing the relationship will make the people miserable into, into two, two sorts. Um, and, and perhaps the distinction isn't as, as clean as I want it to be, but um, it, it depends in part on how, why it is that they're making each other miserable. I mean, if they're making each other miserable um, because they really are competitive and there are these kind of, instead of having these positive, this history of positive responses, there's been, this is incredibly crude, but there's instead been this history of kind of negative responses, then maybe they don't have the right, it may be really they don't have the right sort of history, or they see that they're going to have these responses and they realize that um, the kind of relationship it's supposed to be simply can't continue. Um, so that's one kind of case. The other kind of case, you know, is sort of the star-crossed lovers case, you know, where Romeo and Juliet, where, um, you know, uh, it seems like um, 
uh, they, they, they do have the right sort of attitudes toward one another, um, but external factors are make it, making it the case that they're going to be um, miserable together on balance. You right, know, and, right. and there it doesn't seem to, I mean, it would be weird, you know, if Juliet turned to Romeo and said, you know, our utility levels doth subside, you know, let's pack it <laughs> in. I mean, somehow that doesn't seem to be the right, the right thing to say. So the question is, I think, whether or not, and I think what you were doing is presenting a case which um, uh, uh, maybe can't be neatly sorted into either of those categories. And that, and that would be more problematic. But what I'm tempted to do is say, Either it's the case that they don't have the right sort of responses to one another, so they don't really have the right sort of relationship, or I'm inclined to say they do have the right sort of relationship, and it, it gives them some reason to continue. Um, but, of course, that reason, uh, continuing, can uh, has that benefit, so to speak, but it can have other, but it can be outweighed. Yeah. Um, but that's certainly not the final word, yeah, on that sort of... On that sort of case. So, should we move now to um, to patriotism and to love yeah, of that's country? That's right. Um, right. So, um, uh, there's um, there's a paper that was um, published some years back in in the journal Ethics by Paul Gomberg, um, which I think the title was something like "Patriotism is like racism." Um, you know, and I also remember years back it being said um, there there being the slogan. Um, uh, advanced, I think, by some Palestinian groups, that Zionism is racism. Um, and so I guess my question was, uh, let's not, I mean, that's a, perhaps a, a more explosive example, but just with the first example, which seems sufficiently explosive, um, you know, would you say that, is patriotism just like racism, just substituting um, nationality for race? Or are there important structural differences? Um. Well, I think there are structural differences, and probably it's not that... Uh, I guess there, there are two ways to approach um, questions about patriotism, and, and I think that people who disagree about patriotism often disagree based on which direction they, they come to it from. But one way is to start by thinking about the kinds of considerations we've been talking about so far, which is, obviously, I have... Um, you know, it seems completely unobjectionable that I have special affection for my children and my parents and my wife and so on. And patriotism is just an extension of that. It's just having a special kind of affection for my country and my fellow citizens. Um, the other way to come at patriotism is to say, well, look, there are some kinds of partiality that are just so obviously uh, arbitrary or you know, positively disgusting, like racism. And to say, how is you know, preferring someone on the basis of their nationality any different from preferring them on the basis of, uh, of their race. And the sorts of things that, um, you know, I guess people have said, which I suppose makes some sense, is that uh, patriotism, unlike racism, is perhaps a positive kind of uh, discrimination. So it's a case in which you are wanting your country and your fellow citizens to do well, rather than particularly wanting anyone else to do badly. Um, and that... You know, that, that, that might be the right thing to say, but doing that involves making some claims about what patriotism kind of substantially involves, what kinds of attitudes you're having towards your country, not merely the fact that your attitude towards your country is different from attitudes you have towards others. Um, but that said, here's a case which I don't have much to say about, but that at least pushes me in the direction of maybe thinking that uh, patriotism and racism aren't so dissimilar in some ways. Suppose that you hear of a, a disaster in another country. Maybe there's been an earthquake. Um, it seems as though it would be perfectly legitimate um, to think to yourself, oh, my goodness, I hope none of my family were hurt. You know, perhaps you have family right, right. in that country and you think, I hope none of my family were hurt. Um, it wouldn't be a very nice thing to think, oh, my goodness, I hope that no white people were hurt. <laughs> right. Um, but suppose you thought to yourself, oh, my goodness, I hope that no Australians were hurt or I hope that no Americans were hurt. Um, that seems to me a little bit more like hoping that no white people were hurt than it does hoping that no members of your family were hurt. And uh, I suppose, even though I don't think there's any sort of... You know, it's hard... I think it's a little simplistic to say, look, racism and patriotism are just exactly the same sort of thing. Nevertheless, when you push patriotic feeling to the margins and you see the kinds of discriminations that it makes, you know, uh, feeling differently about people who you've never met and probably wouldn't like if you did met, perhaps... 
um, based on the fact that they live on one side of a border rather than another. It is a funny kind of mental state to get yourself into, and um, funnier, I think, in some ways than the kinds of love and loyalty that you have towards you know, a parent or a child where you do know them and you do know lots about them and you know that you like them and so on. So, so right. So, um, uh, so, I mean, I mean, is, is maybe, you know, uh, one way of making sense of, um, the case where, um, you know, it, it seems weird to think, um, to, to care whether or not it's Australians rather than Indonesians who have, died in the disaster, um, is that maybe because, um, you know, patriotism isn't really love of your countrymen, um, but something like love of your country, where that's understood to be something over and above the, the particular people. So that would explain why maybe, you, you know, you, you cared about, um, uh, you know, whether things fared well in your country more than you cared about whether things fared well in another country, if you had to choose between one of the two. Um, but... That might not that 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 might explain. I mean, if it's really the country that you love and not the countrymen, um, then maybe that would explain why, in this case where the people are no longer in the country, it doesn't really affect the country, so to speak, at all. It would feel odd to show partiality towards those individuals just because they belong to the same country. Right. Yeah. Look, that that could be right. Um, and then I suppose. I mean, so I think that that's you know that's a good response to that worry, perhaps. But it then raises a question which um, I've thought about a bit without having been able to come to any really um, clear conclusions, and that is the question, what is this thing that you are uh, devoted to when you're devoted to a country if it's not right. simply a class of, of individuals of the same sort that you're devoted to when you're devoted to something like a, um, you know, like, you know, a husband or a wife? And uh, I believe there's some historical precedent for worrying about this question um, in the Republic, Plato, as one of the uh, noble lies that he thinks, so lies, as in untruths, that he thinks right, citizens right. ought to be taught, says that uh, in order to have good citizens, you need to tell them that their country is their parent, that it's literally the fatherland or the motherland, and you need to tell them that their citizens are their, their brothers and sisters. And... Uh, he says that he makes it very clear that he thinks this is just not true. It's just a lie to tell them that that's the role that their country and fellow citizens actually uh, have in relation to them. Um, but yet he gives the impression that it's necessary that people believe that lie in order for them to be motivated to defend the country in the way that they must be if the country is to succeed. Now, whatever the value of my Plato scholarship, and um, I'm not making any big claims there, um, <laughs> right. it, it does... <laughs> It does seem to suggest something uh, troubling about loyalty to country. We're used to thinking about countries as imagined communities and, you know, the well-known phrase, as though that's a good thing. But what if, uh, or at least unobjectionable, but what if it turns out that in order to be loyal to a country or to love a country, you have to sort of pretend to yourself that it's something different uh, from what it really is. Maybe you have to treat it as though it you know, really is your parent and as though you really can have, say relationships of mutual care and concern with your right. country, as though your country perhaps can love you in much the same way that a parent can love you. And that is, uh, I guess, just sort of metaphysically, epistemically kind of uh, dubious. Um, it's not clear that a country is something that can do that. Um, so what, but why, um, why is it that in order for um, you to love your country, you, you have to you'd have to personify it. I mean, is there some case that would show, I mean, why couldn't you love um, a thing rather than a, rather than a person? So why is it that you have to sort of, um, you know, maybe it is a metaphysical falsehood that a country really is like a person, but why would you have to think that, um, that, that a country was like a person in order for, in order to love it? Um, Right. Well, you might not, but I think that you have to think that a country is special in some sense. And here, here's the case that I've, um, I've talked about. Um, it's a bit of a silly case, but imagine somebody who feels about his coffee mug the way that his you coffee. or I might feel about our parent or child or, or wife or country. Suppose that it's not just that he likes his coffee mug. He doesn't just think it's an efficient kind of vessel for holding coffee in. 
but he also feels a real loyalty to it and he feels as though he'd be letting his coffee mug down if he were to fail to keep it clean or if he were to start using another coffee mug instead. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think our reaction to that person is that he's a little bit insane he's, or he's imagining his coffee mug to be right. something more than, than a coffee mug could ever really be. Right. Here, here I go. Anyway, the question that, that we were talking about is the question of how uh, you have to imagine a country to be in order to see it as an appropriate object of uh, your love and serious loyalty, in order to see it as something with which you share a profound relationship or as something for which it uh, makes sense, for which it makes sense for you to make you know, considerable ser- uh, personal sacrifices. And I guess the one thing I wanted to add is that it is, I think, notable if you look at the kind of rhetoric that people produce in defence of uh, patriotism and love and loyalty to country, it tends to uh, say it tends to involve claims that are simply false and false because they over-personalise a country. Um, they picture a country as brave or a country as uh, plucky or a country right. as right. grand or a country as the motherland or the fatherland. So. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I do think there's some reason at least to suspect that regardless of what moral value we think patriotism and loyalty to country might have, um, there's a reason to uh, worry that it involves a kind of epistemic mistake, that in order to get ourselves into the mood to love our countries, we have to imagine them to be simply things other other than what they are. Right, because otherwise we, 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 we couldn't see them, we couldn't see ourselves as having this relationship of mutual concern, and it seems like we have to see ourselves as having a relationship of mutual concern to make sense of um, uh, love or loyalty, um, to, to explain why something goes wrong when the person loves or is loyal to his mug. Yeah, that, yeah. that's at least yeah. often what, what happens. We sort of think, look, my country has looked after me, my country cares for right. me, right. Um, my country is loyal to me, perhaps, and that's why I need to return uh, loyalty to my country. And uh, look, it might be just... It might be right to think that a country is capable, for example, of concern or loyalty, but uh, it's not obvious, and it's certainly hard to imagine that a country could be capable of very particularised right, love right. and loyalty of the kind that we give uh, to our country. So perhaps it was nice of my country to provide me with an education and safe roads and a police force and so on, but they certainly weren't doing it, or my country certainly didn't do that out of a concern for Simon or because it cares for me and wanted to do something nice for me. So to that extent, to the extent that uh, loving something involves sort of picking it out as a particular, right. um, it doesn't right. seem as though our countries love us. So the relationship right. Is, right. is asymmetric in, in that sense. Right, right, right. Um, and so in some of, I mean, so there you, you, you're suggesting that loyalty to country or patriotism, uh, which I think maybe you'd want to distinguish, but in any event, both of those attitudes might involve a kind of, one kind of um, epistemic error. Uh, one kind of false belief, namely the false belief that um, countries are um, like people. Um, but in some of your other work, you've also, I think, explored the idea that there's a more pervasive kind of false belief or tendency to false belief um, that goes along with patriotism. Right. So maybe you could, yes. Yeah, maybe well, I think the first thing to do is to focus a little more on patriotism as a variety a distinct variety of love of country. Okay. Um, and one way to see that patriotism is not simply love of country, one way is simply that you can love a country that's not your own. So you can be an American who loves Canada or an American who loves France, but that doesn't make right. you a Canadian or a French patriot. Right. Um, but right. probably more, more importantly, um, when we think of someone who's patriotic, I think we th- always think of somebody who takes pride in their country. And um, you can't, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to say, oh, I'm an Australian patriot and yet I'm ashamed to be Australian or I wish I wasn't Australian (laughs) or I take no pride in Australia. I mean, I think you could still love Australia under those conditions, but you couldn't be an Australian patriot. Right, right. Um, But there are two elements to taking pride um, in a country. First of all, there's a measure of identification. So it's not just admiration. It's not just seeing the country as um, worthy in certain ways but it's rather identifying with it in a way that allows you to feel pride in that worthiness. 
Um, but also, you know, the, the second part simply is seeing the country as worthy. So a patriot might disagree with all kinds of things that her country does, and she might think that in lots of ways her country is not a very good country. But at some level, um, any kind of patriotic attitude to country involves seeing some particular aspect of the country that is taken to be quite fundamental, that is to say something about what the country really is, and is also taken to be uh, positive, to be something that it's worth taking pride in. So when you think, for example, about patriotic dissent, people who uh, say that as a patriot they have to uh, disagree or pro with, disagree with or protest against what the government is doing, that kind of patriotic dissent can never simply be about saying you're doing the wrong thing. It also has to be about saying you're doing something that is in some ways un-Australian, say, or does not capture what the true values of this country are. That's what makes it patriotic right, right. dissent. Okay, so, so far so good. But the concern that I have is that if patriotism is this attitude that combines both identifying with a country and seeing it as having uh, value or being worthy in a certain way, then it involves a judgment of a certain sort, a judgment that the country has certain valuable features. And yet, the patriotism itself is not grounded in, or not based upon, or doesn't derive from any kind of uh, uh, objective sort of consideration as to whether the country really meets that description. So, I think that what we find in um, patriotic thinking is a need to uh, maintain a picture of the country as something that meets a certain positive description, but your maintaining that picture is not necessarily or is unlikely to be motivated simply by a judgment that the evidence supports right, that right. picture of the country. So you can feel as though, you know, for example, you need to feel that Australia has certain values at its heart or that Australia is basically a good country or whatever, because as a patriot it would be sort of first disloyal not to, and secondly it would be a challenge to your own self-conception because you're not just making the judgment that Australia meets this description, but you're kind of identifying and feeling pride, identifying with and feeling pride in Australia as a result of that description. So, that, so I mean, that, that, that seems to leave us in a fairly, what at first glance looks like a fairly tragic situation. I mean, so we have these two, two, two things which intuitively seem like virtues. You know, it's a virtue to be a patriot. It's a good thing about someone if they're patriotic. And it also seems like it's certainly a good thing about someone if they, you know, if they, if they listen to the evidence and they have an open mind and they really come to a judgment on the basis of the, of the facts. So, um, so what do we, to make of that? I mean, do we, or do we, is it just sort of a tragic situation we have to live with or is it, um, or, I mean, are we supposed to resolve it in some way? Does it really show that one of the two isn't really the virtue we thought it was? Um, well, certainly my inclination is to conclude that patriotism is not a virtue, and I suppose my sense is that we can get by without it. But I think much of the question depends upon how we uh, make the case that patriotism is a virtue, if that's a case that we want to make. Um, it'd be fairly unproblematic if all that we were saying was that patriotism has certain instrumental uh, values associated with it. So we might say, you know, perhaps in the spirit of Plato, that having patriotic people allows the society to function better. It allows us to defend ourselves. It allows us to uh, have a political body that we wouldn't be able to have otherwise. And if that's right, then, you know, there's really nothing... I mean, I suppose it, you, you might see it as a tragic situation, but it's certainly not philosophically confusing. It's simply a case of a, uh, an attitude which on its own terms is uh, epistemically, uh, uh, you know, involves a kind of epistemic mistake in the way that a false belief might, but in instrumental terms actually produces good effects, again, in the way that a false belief might produce good effects. Um, I think it becomes more troubling if we see some sort of intrinsic value to patriotism and we think then that we're sort of left in a situation where in order to instantiate some kind of fundamental virtue or some aspect of what it is to be a good person, we need to close ourselves off 
to certain sorts of evidence or we need to work hard to maintain, in this case, to maintain a picture of our country, um, whether that picture meets the evidence or not. Um, and I'd hope to... I think that we ought to try to avoid getting into that position because uh, I'd like to think that the uh, realm of virtue is a little less tragic than that. Right. But I think the way to do that is to start thinking about other ways in which you can uh, serve or love or feel affection for a country that are not patriotic, that don't necessarily involve, you know, waving the flag and uh, identifying yourself strongly with the country and seeing it necessarily as an, as an object of pride. And, um, you know, offhand, it seems like there's, there's hope for that sort of project. We certainly, in other cases, seem to be able to maintain a love for something that's ours, even if we don't uh, have pride in that thing as a fundamental part of, of the love. You can, you know, you can genuinely love and feel care and special concern for a parent, even after you've concluded that that parent is not someone who you're very proud of. So I guess no. that's more the sort of uh, civic virtue that I'd like to push people towards. Right. Right, right. Um, well, I mean, in a way, that's a good segue to our, to our, next, uh, to our, to our next topic, which, um, which had to do with uh, whether or not um, love had conditions. So, you know, um, and, it, and it looks like, uh, it looks like, um, at very least, love isn't going to have the kind of conditions that patriotism is going to have. In other words, you can only be patriotic if you actually um, think that your country is um, is uh, valuable or or whatever. Whereas in the case of um, loving your father, say, um, you might still love your father and be loyal to your father, even if you didn't think that your father, um, even if you were to come to learn that the things which you originally um, were proud of in your father, um, uh, you know, were were based on myths or falsehoods. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that what that, um, I mean, maybe just, I think that what, you know, what that has to make us face is the fact that uh, there are different, not just different objects of love, but also different kinds of love. I mean, I guess this is obvious when you think about it. You know, the way that you love your parent is obviously very different from the way that you love your wife. Um, but the extent to which endorsement or pride is involved in a particular kind of love, um, you know, can vary. I think there are some people who, uh, whose relationship with a father or a grandfather, say, is such that um, it's very much founded upon uh, pride and can involve this same kind of resistance mm. to any evidence that would suggest that, that, that that's not... Um, an emotion that's that's merited in this case. And when you look at other cases, I think, in which you can feel pride in uh, someone you love, you can see that the pride is actually fairly easily separable from the right, love. Right. So, for example, that's I might say, you know, I'm very, very proud of my son, but, of course, you know, the reason I think he's so wonderful, at least in part, is that I'm biased because I'm, I'm, I'm his father. And I can say that without in any way questioning uh, the love that I have for him. But whether you'd want to say then that the alternative to having a love that's grounded in, in pride or a, a sense that the uh, object of the love is worthy is then unconditional right, um, right. is a tougher question, and I have to admit not one that I've, uh, I've been able to reach any sort of uh, any clear conclusions about. I mean, what do you think? Do you think there is an ideal of unconditional love that's uh, both something that's worth striving for in some instances and also truly unconditional? Right. Um... You know, well, well, here I find it hard to sort of answer that, you know, I've, I'm sort of in the grip of my own theory. So, you know, I think that the, I mean, so I'll speak from, from you know, from, from the confines of that theory. Um, uh, so I would think that the, um, or at least what I'm committed to, I suppose, is that um, uh, uh, if there are conditions on love, they're going to be uh, conditions on the kind of relationship you have. Um, so, in other words, if it makes sense to cease loving someone because some factor has changed, I think it's going to be um, some factor that uh, has to do with the relationship, that the relationship has um, has changed. Now, there are some kinds of uh, there are some kinds of relationships where you might think that there's very little that can really change the relationship after a certain point. I mean, so you might think, 
um, you know, my love for my children, um, if the relevant history is that I was the one who raised them, you know, over a period of time, then you might see there's, there's really nothing they need to do um, after that time that would change the fact that they're my children. Um, and so that would make sense, perhaps, of why our love for our children is, it seems, more unconditional or less conditional um, than, say, our um, our love for um, our friends, our, um, our spouses, um, where, you know, the, the history can go awry. I mean, we can, um, you know, we can have falling outs. Um, but it seems to me that, that if something is going to make the um, ceasing to love someone appropriate, it's going to be um, something that changes the relationship. So it's not going to be that some intrinsic feature of theirs changes, that they become somehow, you know, they, they lose their looks or um, they become uh, less funny. Or even, I think, you know, if we uh, discover that they're really um, bad people, um, right. at least in their relations to people other than us. I mean, so I kind of, maybe I shouldn't say this, but, you know, I kind of think that, you know, um, you know, maybe um, Eva Braun had, had, had reasons to love Hitler, although, um, you know, Nadezhda Ayulayev, uh, you know, Stalin's second wife, um, uh, maybe didn't have reasons to love him because he treated her so badly. But, you know, it, it, as far as I can tell, you know, Hitler was pretty good to Eva Braun. Um, right, so yeah. maybe she, she really does have reason to, to love him because what matters is, 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 is the relationship, not, is, is, um, and, and not the person understood independently of that. But maybe right. that's, maybe that's going too far. I don't know. Right. I mean, it can be a matter of psychological truth. It seems that, um, you could just find yourself no longer loving. I know Bertrand Russell uh, says in his autobiography that he just was riding his bike one day and he suddenly <laughs> stopped loving his wife. Right. And, um, I mean, obviously, that that was apparently due to some change in him, it seems, not to, due, due to some change in her. But certainly, you know, our friends and, um, you know, romantic partners can suddenly change in ways that leave us no longer loving them, whether those ways affect the relationship or not. Right, and right. Um, I mean, one suggestion uh, that I think has some appeal is that perhaps rather than saying that love is unconditional, because after all, who could really make a con- commitment to love somebody unconditionally, given that love mm. is something over which we don't, you know, have a lot of direct control? Um, could it be instead that there are some forms of love, most particularly love for children, but maybe love for others as well, where in loving them? In the first instance, part of what you do is take on a commitment to continue to treat them well or to continue to treat them specially, even should you no longer love them. So that perhaps if, uh, you know, if your uh, spouse was to have a terrible accident that left them uh, unable to interact with you, you know, really in any way whatsoever... Um, you know, might, might the right thing to say in such a case, I suppose this seems plausible to me, be that um, even if you no longer love them, uh, part of what it was to love them originally was to com- make a commitment to continue looking after them and treat, treat them specially, um, even under conditions like these. Right, I see. So, so I mean, so, so um, it would still be sort of inappropriate for you no longer to treat them specially, but there... Um, you're treating them specially wouldn't be based itself in love, but rather in sort of um, living up to the commitments um, that were constitutive of um, that were part of loving them earlier. Is that is that the thought? Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, 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 um, uh, yeah. I mean that that certainly has that certainly has a certain um, uh, you know a certain appeal to it. Um, uh, I mean, but then what do you make of the you know the the the, the line from Shakespeare's spot sonnet that um, love is not love, um, uh, you know, if it alters, when it alteration finds. Well, um, it does seem that there's a certain kind of love involves a certain kind of constancy. I mean, that is um, a certain kind of uh, 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 tendency to continue even if um, the person changes in various ways. Or maybe that's just um, uh, a kind of fiction, the sort of thing that might be um, sort of pleasing to read in a, in, in a poem, but doesn't really capture right. the actual phenomenon. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Amelie Rorty has a really, I think, really nice paper, which is where the headline is that line from Shakespeare, but with a pertinent knot inserted. 
Um, and her <laughs> argument is that, in fact, if you truly love someone, then your love ought to change when it encounters alteration because that's part of what it is to be truly responsive to another person in the way that love requires. And at least... In, and, and this is something where I think, you know, it depends a lot on the kind of relationship that we're talking about. Um, I sort of do feel as though love of... I mean, I guess generally in family context, love of a child versus love of a parent, it seems as though the way that you... At least the way that you love your child or your parent um, may change a little bit, but basically, you know, properly stays the same regardless of what changes they undergo. Um, but I do feel a bit differently with my friends and with, uh, you know, my wife. When I think of the way that we loved each other, you know, 15 years ago, it'd be kind of embarrassing if we continued to love each other in that way now. And right. if she continued to love me, if, if, if her love continued, I suppose, to be the same kind of attitude that it was then, I mean, exactly the same kind of attitude, then I'd sort of feel as though she hadn't really been noticing me for all these years. Um, yeah, so I guess I... But then on the other hand, I wouldn't want it to be an option that she stopped loving me altogether. So perhaps the fact that you love um, is something that ideally, you know, remains even when it encounters alteration, but the way that you love and the responses that your love involves and maybe even the object or the aspects of the person that your love is a response to, I think that quite properly could change, at least within within romantic contexts and and in the case of friendship, as it encounters alteration. Right, right. What that says about unconditionality... um, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. But uh, I'm certainly not drawn, not attracted to the idea that if you love someone, then that's just it. And the way that you love them and the fact that you love them is not going to vary uh, ever, regardless on what kinds of changes right, right. you might undergo. Well, I think I would, I, yeah, no, I think I, I would agree with that. I mean, to some extent, I mean, love, part of the response um, uh, that love consists in is a um, sort of an openness or a kind of um, a tendency to appreciate people's qualities. And so if someone wasn't um, changing in how they viewed you or they wouldn't, weren't coming to appreciate or notice new things, then they weren't, I think that's right to say that they, um, that, that wouldn't be love at all, or at least it wouldn't be um, everything we'd want from love. I mean, something that's kind of interesting about this uh, you know, about this discussion of unconditional love is, you know, you find yourself kind of um, uh, uh, torn. On, on the one hand, you want to be loved for, you know, for your qualities. It's kind of, you know, insulting if, uh, if my wife said that the only reason she stays around with me is because, you know, we were together all these years and there's nothing that she finds appealing about me now. On the other hand, there's something sort of terrifying about the thought that, you know, uh, love that, uh, you know, your spouse's love for you just depends on um, on uh, the appreciation of your qualities and there isn't some sort of deeper loyalty. Um, I, I, would, I mean, what does... Do you ever discuss these things with Marie? I mean, do you ever discuss these topics with your wife? I wonder what she makes of... Mine, yeah, I think. I think mine uh, expresses uh, the same sort of ambivalence, I think, yeah. But, um, so, no, we don't ever discuss these topics, um, but maybe because, you know, we wouldn't like what we heard. <laughs> um, but I wonder whether there's a, uh, I mean, when I, see, I hope that there are things that, um, yeah, that my wife can, uh, can identify about me that she finds attractive and that would cause her not to suddenly fall in love with one of my colleagues, for example, um, or that, that would always give, would always explain to me, you know, when I say, why not the guy in the next office, she should always be able to say something better than, well, I just don't have the right history with him. You know, right. I'd like her to say something that, that makes me feel a bit better about myself than that. But at the same time, I know there are some people that I just can't compete with. So it was just <laughs> a matter of, you know, objective, uh, you know, looks and intelligence and sense of humor and so on. I mean, I think you should be particularly worried about this living in California because um, there really <laughs> are these tanned and more muscles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, th- I think there is an interesting class of properties that maybe sits somewhere in between the kind of intrinsic, valuable features that a person might have and the uh, purely relational features. Mm -hmm. And those are features that involve, uh, that are intrinsic, but, well, as in, aren't to do specifically with the relationship, but nevertheless depend upon the existence of the relationship for their existence. So, for example, one thing, you know, when I think about why I'm glad I'm married to Marie, even if, you know, I was offered the opportunity to instead have a relationship with... um, 
Oh, I, I don't want to reveal too much. Let's just say some amazingly wonderful Hollywood star or something. <laughs> I mean, one thing about yes. Marie is that she knows how to... She, she knows me well, and she knows how to treat right. me when I'm in certain moods, and she knows how to make me happy when I'm feeling down. And she gets on well with my family, and she's come to understand them and, you know, respond to them in ways that I find, uh, that I find appealing and attractive and, um, you know, sustainable and so on. So... I wonder whether maybe it's a little misleading to imagine that if we're talking about the qualities of a person that make us love her, then we must be talking about things as kind of, uh, I don't know, I suppose as intrinsic as simply, you know, intelligence, sense of humour, right, looks, right. likes a good long walk on the, on the beach and so on. Maybe we should talk instead about things like, uh, you know, particular knowledge of me, particular uh, ways of treating me. Now, those are things that, you know, a person could only have in virtue of having shared a relationship with me, but they uh, arise from the relationship rather than being sort of constitutive of the relationship itself. Of course, you know, there still is the problem. What if her twin suddenly turned out, right. turned up and had, you know, magically developed um, all of the skills uh, that, that allow her to perform the same function? Um, that, and, but I think that would be an incredibly uh, confusing situation to <laughs> so I'm not sure what to say. You'd have to have all the same all memories and yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, but at least when it comes sense. to com- at least when it comes to comparing myself with um, you know, Brad Pitt, at least there right, are some right. things I know about uh, how to treat Marie and make her happy that, that he doesn't know, whatever other virtues he might have. That's right, that's right, right. So it makes the twin more and more improbable. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think um uh, it's 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 been a, a pleasure um, uh, talking to you about these subjects. Yeah. I hope I hope we haven't um, put ourselves in the doghouse with our wives. I hope we haven't <laughs> said anything to um, um, uh, I'll watch it over to regret. Again before deciding with yeah, that's right. Again. Before we send it, before we send it. Um, but it, it's been a real pleasure, and, and um, you know, I hope we get a chance to talk about these issues more soon. Yeah, you too, Nico. Thanks. Okay. Bye. See you.